Even before the pandemic pushed our ministries online, video and audio had become essential tools in the church communicator's toolbox. Whether you're recording announcement videos, devotions, testimonies, promos, podcasts, or pre-recording your entire worship service, we're here to help you up your game on today's episode of the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast. Thank you to everybody for listening. My name is Dan Wunderlich. I'm a United Methodist pastor. And before we jump into today's episode, I want to share a special opportunity with you. We're approaching the end of an unprecedented year where we're all no doubt learning and growing and being stretched in ways we could never have imagined. Well, we want to hear what you've learned this year. It can be something big picture or small in scope, conceptual or practical, personal or technical. Email us at podcast at umcom.org to share what you've learned and help us with something special we're planning. Well, today I'm joined again by Catherine Price, a video producer at United Methodist Communications. Welcome back, Catherine. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, on our last episode, you gave us a whole bunch of help when it came to live streaming. And listeners, if you haven't checked that episode out yet, I would encourage you to go find it. But even though both live streaming and pre-recorded are essentially just two ways delivering audio and video content, they can be completely different animals when it comes to production, equipment, and workflow. Isn't that right, Catherine? Absolutely. I love live stream stuff and live events because once you're done, you're done and you can throw away the <laughs> script and everything. But pre-recorded is uh, completely different. All right. Well, let's start with a step that many of us likely skip entirely, and that's uh, pre-planning. It's one of those things that if we're cutting together highlights from an event or a weekend service, uh, you know, you maybe you don't have to do. But if we're making a video or an audio project where the content can be planned ahead of time, that can only help. What are some of the steps you recommend we go through before we set up our gear and hit record? Uh, yeah, so pre-production is like my favorite part of production personally, but if you haven't ever made a video yet, you might not realize that. And so I would say go ahead and just make your video and then <laughs> on the second one, you will understand like, wow, it would have been way better if I had done a lot of things beforehand. Um, specifically, I think going in knowing the end before you even start shooting mm -hmm. is the most important thing. Figure out what is your desired outcome of your video, not like what you want the video to look like, but what do you want people to be doing after the video is done? Like, what do you want them to be thinking about? There should only be one outcome and it should be, oh, they're going to go here or they're going to want to do this. So have that in mind going in. And then what format resolution do you need it to be? Because that's going to determine how you film it, how yeah. you edit it, and then how, like where you're going to be able to post it. So knowing that on the front end is really important. And then have a script. I know that it might seem unnecessary if you're like doing an interview, but even just having an outline or a list of bullets or a list of questions, something, or maybe it is verbatim. Maybe you're going to have a teleprompter. Script out every single thing that you're going to need for your video so that you don't forget it. Yeah. And then if you are, well, most likely you're filming it somewhere. And in that case, scout out the location. You don't have to like hire a whole crew and do a huge big scout, <laughs> yeah. but like just go to the area that you're planning on shooting and make sure that the vision that you have for your shoot is going to work in that spot. Like you might not realize it until you get in there. Even if it's in your own building, you might not realize it till you get in the room that, oh, there's actually a huge window right there and I can't film right there. Or, oh, there's a huge picture on this wall and it's going to look really weird. So I need to do this somewhere, somewhere else. And then also like if it's at a certain time of day and there's a, that's when the lawnmower shows up then right. and it's a weekly thing, like it's always going to be at that time. It's a good thing to know that, okay, this is the activity that's going on around this time. So I'm going to have to deal with this type of lighting, these type of sounds, whatever interference, like it's just good to have that ahead of time and to know that that is what you need to expect because otherwise it'll be a very unfortunate surprise. Yeah, absolutely. And then like practicing with your gear, if it's new gear, it's really a good idea to just go ahead and like do some test uh, clips with it and make sure you're getting actually the type of footage that you want because it would be a really big bummer to spend all day recording everything and then you look at it later and you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually like orange and I did not <laughs> like this look and this is not what I was expecting. So just uh, getting used to like knowing how to set up your gear and how long it takes to even set it up. That's just yeah. a good idea for when you're scheduling because it's a really great thing to schedule liberally for your day. It's way better to have to end early and then it is to run late. 
And especially if you have like a view of outside in the background, if you run into uh, like nighttime and you started during the day, uh, those shots aren't really going to cut together so well. Right. Yeah. So it's good to just plan for the worst case scenario ever. And then also practice beforehand. Not everybody is an actor. Just because the, you can run a, do a sermon in front of people, you may not be actually be good on camera or yes. whatever it is. Some people just are not good at delivering in front of a camera. And so just doing a read through ahead of time makes a humongous difference. Oh, that is so true. And like you, just because you can deliver a sermon in person, like the number of times you probably stutter or hesitate or things that just even out over the course of a sermon, if you're recording like a 30 second promo for something, you, it has to come across clean. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to sound like a robot, but yeah, those are two totally different skills. Yeah. And that's how I am like even for preparing for this podcast, like I'm just not good at like off the cuff talking. And so yeah. I had to have some notes like in front of me to like just keep me on track. So even though I don't, it's not like a full script, it's still bullet points that help me get through it. And some people are really great at not having anything in front of them. But, mm. uh, but I, even when we uh, are doing shoots in the studio, we always encourage every single speaker. Some of them are like, oh no, I don't need notes. And we're like, I know you don't think you need notes, but it would be really helpful for us to have an outline so that also we know where you're going with something and we can tell whether or not you actually got there. Uh, so it's just good to have that, even if you think you don't need it. It'll, it, it comes in handy both for you and for the editor later. <laughs> hundred percent, hundred percent. I, I almost got into a pickle where I just kept flubbing because I was trying to do it off the top of my head. And we were at a location with one camera battery and no power outlet. And mm -hmm. that, that battery <laughs> oh icon turned gosh. red and it was like, all right, this is it. You either yeah. get it now or we all have to come back another time or like an hour later or whatever. And you know, that kind of pressure, I guess, <laughs> up the game. Yeah. Got it done, but Oh man, you know, and then of course you realize later I wasted so much time for all of these other folks and they right. laughed it off at the time, but it's like, oh yeah, it's not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, you have a great resource coming to resource UMC soon if it's not up already. And it's all about writing a video script and uh, you have some really helpful templates that are included. I served as the worship coordinator for the Florida Annual Conference this year. And with uh, all of the COVID stuff, all of the worship services were online. They were all pre recorded, which meant things like the retirement service and the memorial service were all pre-recorded. And, and, you know, that's, you want to make those really memorable and meaningful experiences, especially if people are having to do them at home and not with their family or with their colleagues retiring. And I can't tell you how much easier this process would have been if I had just had your templates. Like <laughs> I just needed to interview you for the show like a month <laughs> earlier and things would have gone so much better. Um, so thankfully we had an awesome video editor at one of our local churches who was able to decipher my like Google doc <laughs> spreadsheets. Um, but can you share from your own experience, how much smoother editing and even the shooting process will go if we put in this kind of work ahead of time? Yes. There's a phrase that everybody says on set, which is, oh, fix it in post. But contrary <laughs> to popular belief, not everything can actually be fixed in post. And that's why yeah. everybody always says it because it's like, ha ha ha. What if we tried to do that? No, do not do that. Uh, like just storyboards and like breaking down your script ahead of time and having a shot list. That is literally a template for the editor. And that and like making those ahead of time, it forces you as the director or whatever your role is, it forces you to think through those visuals before you actually start shooting. So then it makes you more deliberate when you are shooting and it leaves less guesswork in the edit room. So, I mean, it saves you time. It saves you pulling out your hair when you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot the most important thing, which is saying my name and introducing myself. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it, I think of it like going to the grocery store without a list. I end up getting a bunch of random things. They don't even go together. And I get home and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot the most, the main ingredient, which was yeah. the reason yeah. I even went to the grocery store. So going into the shoot with the end game in mind helps make sure you shoot everything you need. And then your editor is going to be so grateful whenever they can look at it and it's all organized and it's all there. <laughs> 
Well, and I, you know, I just think some some directors like the Lord of the Rings. Now, granted, in the Lord of the Rings, it was massive, and they had visual effects and live <laughs> actors and practical effects. But like they they basically animated the whole movie ahead of time, mm-hmm. so that they knew what it would look like, so that they could get the shots they needed. And even if you're on a TV show like The Office, which has had a massive resurgence in popularity, it's just a bunch of people sitting in one room that's lighted the same every day of the week they still plan everything like who are we to think yeah. like that we can just do it off the fly when the people whose job it is to do this day in and day out do right. these steps in these processes like they trust me they know we should we should maybe think a little bit low, <laughs> lower of ourselves. yeah i know and like even for general conference like i make every single presentation every single moment of general conference is scripted out at least in an outline. Like we know every single thing that's coming up next. We know which presentation is coming up next, what slide goes when they say what word. So, I mean, it is down to every second just about. And then we not only use those during the live show, but the editors use those when we get back to the building after general conference or even like later on in the night when people ask if they need certain clips pulled from certain sessions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, like we have those scripts already. And so they can reference those. They know what to look for in the video file. So it just comes in handy both for live and pre-recorded stuff. And then trying to, if you want to repurpose your live stuff later, it's just really helpful to have for literally anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as we get closer toward the recording phase, I want to first talk about audio. Uh, obviously, if you're doing an audio project like a podcast, audio is key and hopefully you all appreciate the uh, effort our team puts into to creating quality audio, but it's also vital in video projects, isn't it? Uh, yes. Audio is more important than video and anybody who says differently is wrong. And I'm happy <laughs> to tell them that because that's wrong. It is the thing that nobody notices until it's messed up, but, and you won't understand the value of it until you don't have good audio. But I said it in the last podcast we did, but if people are speaking, the audio matters. So don't discount it and don't think of it as an afterthought. You need to be thinking about the video and audio equally when you're putting together everything because the audio can make or break your video. People will not watch it if you can't, if they can't hear it. It's, it's just not, it, ruins the experience and it ruins the quality of the video. And especially in the era when everybody has a smartphone and anybody can make a video, good audio is what separates a good video from a bad video. So yes, audio is very important. (laughs) Well, and I'll even say, you know, you, and we've probably all found ourselves in situations like this, you're watching a video on mute and you can do that now because some of these platforms like YouTube and Facebook do AI generated Uh, captions. Mm -hmm. And if you have terrible audio on your video, that's going to get garbled as well. So Mm -hmm. even if people don't actually end up listening to the audio, which is crazy, you should still have good audio because that is going to help the captions, which may make a difference between someone sitting in a meeting who should be listening to the meeting, you know, or if you're laying in bed next to your spouse who's sleeping and your AirPods are dead. And so you're watching YouTube videos on mute, like that can actually help as strange as it sounds. Yes, I agree. I just think it's just so important. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And again, uh, you have another resource coming on Resource UMC if it's not up already, and that's some audio tips and tricks. And and I'm an audio person. I've hosted podcasts for years, but I still learned a ton from it. Uh, And we'll let our listeners go check out all those details uh, when the video comes out. But could you just go over quickly uh, when uh, the internal mic on a filming device is fine, when we might need an external mic, and the one that unfortunately shocked me more than I thought it would why I should stop using my AirPods to film videos. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think the general rule of thumb would be try to avoid using the internal mic as often as possible. Um, in a smartphone, they're really great. That's probably the only case in which I would say an internal mic will be okay. As long as it's like an arm's length away, like if you're doing a selfie video or or if, even if you're just doing a regular video, but you're keeping it about an arm's length away from the speaker, that's might be fine. Like the internal, internal mic will be plenty. But if that's a DSLR or an HD video camera, the internal mics just are not good on those. Yeah, and yeah. they really should, those audio files on those, like don't turn the audio off on those, but you really only need to use that track as a reference file in editing to sync up your audio. Because um, it's just not 
I don't know that they're just not made well to they're just not good. <laughs> so they're like and they but they always all cameras are equipped with the plugins and everything to have a an external mic on it. And so that is the best thing and the best option in most cases is to have an external mic. And especially now there are plenty that are um, compatible with a smartphone or your a laptop, or if you have a an external mic already and it's not, it doesn't have that uh, adapter, then you can get an adapter for it and plug it into your phone or plug it yeah. into your laptop. So there's lavalier or lapel mics, uh, directional shotgun mics, which you would just hang sort of around the speaker, uh, a handheld recorder, or you can even use your iPhone as the recorder as long as you're using it either as a shotgun mic or with a micro, an external mic, and then you record in the video memo app, or the sorry, the voice memo app. Yeah. Um, so whatever works best for your setup, and and but then keep in mind it might change. Like depending on what you're shooting, you might need a couple different options in case uh, one of them just isn't going to work. Especially like w- with lapel mics and la- and lavalier mics. Sometimes people wear clothes weird or like the clothes they're wearing, like it's just not going to work to have a lapel mic on there. And especially if it's just too distracting to just see that mic, you might want to have a directional mic instead and so that it's out of the shot, but you're still getting good audio. Um, So definitely prioritize audio in your budget. I would say invest in audio gear before you invest in uh, video gear because it is going to make the biggest difference in the quality of your video. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then um, about AirPods. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had told my brother this the other day too, because he was talking to me on the phone on his AirPods. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you on your AirPods? I can tell. And he was like, ah, they're supposed to be great. Well, okay. I get that they are convenient. And that is the thing about Bluetooth. It is specifically meant for convenience, not for quality. And so when you are, when you're using the AirPods as a mic, the Bluetooth bandwidth is just limited. And so it's going to con- compress your audio file as you are transmitting it. And so when you get that audio file at the end, it is it does not have as much information as you yeah. would get with a wire connection or with a wireless transmitter. Like with a lav and you have the belt pack, that's not Bluetooth, that's wireless transmitter. And that's very different. And you get a very different size file than with Bluetooth. And then also Bluetooth is like competing with different wire with like a wireless frequency around it. And if other things are trying to connect to it or passing through it, then you might have an audio drop or other issues. And if you aren't monitoring your audio, you might not even notice it until you get into the edit room. So yeah, Bluetooth is great for airdrop. That's like my favorite thing about Bluetooth, but, and it's really (laughs) convenient for headphones, but like Bluetooth headphones that I have, I just, I mean, they're like my backup because the wired connection is just better. And especially it for recording audio. And again, you know, if you're doing Instagram stories or you're hopping on Instagram or Facebook live just for a moment to pop in, check on folks, totally fine. We're, oh, we're yeah. talking about we're talking about recording a video that you intend to release uh, you know, somehow mm-hmm. some way or show in worship where you want the quality uh, to be there. You don't want to sound garbled uh, on a video like that. Yeah, it's so. yeah, having it for informal things is great. And again, it's really convenient to have. <laughs> but for yeah. professional videos, no way. So as we start to trend towards the editing phase, uh, but let's still stick in the realm of audio, uh, no matter whether you're doing a podcast or you're recording the audio track for a video, there is something called room tone. Now, I had heard about this for a long time because I've been doing podcasting for forever, but I'm embarrassed to say I never really researched it as much as I should have. And now I'm realizing why so many people talk about it. Uh, what is room tone? How do we deal with it? And why might that be maybe that small layer of polish that's not that hard to clean up, but makes your project sound professional? Sure. So room tone is the background silence or like the natural background noise of a room itself when everything in the room is at rest. And like, especially when everyone in the video shoot, like the people who are in the room, like everyone's still in there, but they are not talking and not moving and not making any noise. (laughs) So even if you think that you can't hear anything, uh, your microphone definitely can. My microphone can pick up my neighbors and everything. Like it, you don't realize how loud a room is (laughs) (laughs) when nothing's happening. (laughs) But, uh, but in order to get, and so whenever you get into editing, you hear that like hum, it comes from things like the, um, like power lines of equipment, like especially of lights, um, or like a, 
uh, an AC unit or a fridge or even like the ice maker in a fridge. Like when I have my ice maker off, it's a lot quieter yes. than if I have it on. And like, it's not one of those things that you'll pick up on with just like when you're just hanging out. But when you're listening to it later, man, it is just so loud. And but it's really easy to get that out. Like the noise removal trick in editing is just so simple. And all you have to do is have a few seconds, I think in like audition, and I think it says like one or like 0.5 seconds. But like, I would say get at least like five, 10. When, whenever we're on set, we always get 30 seconds of room tone. Because that way you have you're sort of creating a sample to pull from for your editing program and to tell it, okay, this is the sound that I want you to memorize and I want you to take it out of this file. And so yeah. then it just make turns that background noise down. And then also a, like on movies and stuff, like if you ever watch a movie where there's like a fluorescent light and you can hear it, like that's purposeful. They did not right. accidentally right. leave that in there. They wanted you to feel that you're in a room with a really loud fluorescent light. And so they put that noise back in there because they had room tone of that fluorescent light and they needed to, to fill right there so that you created that atmosphere. And then and it, when they're cutting stuff together, you also use that room tone just to like even out and hide those cuts because otherwise it's going to sound really choppy because that dead space, it, it's not always the same. So you do have to like, you might have to tweak it sometimes depending on if there's like all of a sudden a lawnmower in the background. Uh, but yeah, overall, just having that, those like 10 seconds of just like silence, which it seems weird whenever you're uh, shooting it, but because like you basically just turn on everything and then be quiet. And then later you use it and man, it is like magic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, sometimes it's even not even the room. It could be the mic. Your mic have a, might have a hiss to it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those things can be removed. Now, this is, I, I don't think this is a feature you're going to find in something like iMovie. Uh, but if you are working in a slightly... Uh, you know, one step up or two step up, particularly if you're in the o Adobe Creative Suite, um, those tools are available and they are not nearly as hard to work with. Oh my as, gosh. Yeah. It's just so anything. easy. Yeah. It's in Adobe, it's called Adobe Audition, but you can also do it in like Logic or, I mean, or Audacity. I think that's a free one. Yeah. But yeah, you usually have to do it in a specific audio editor program. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, it is just like, I mean, it takes like maybe 30 seconds, one minute at most, um, because you can just remove the noise out of an entire file all at once. So yeah, it's pretty, it's really great. Awesome. Well, Catherine, we're going to take a break, but uh, you don't go away and listeners don't go away because after the break, we're diving into video and editing. Are you still serving your local church in a leadership role? Ministry would suffer without dedicated members and leaders like you. We want to continue to support your vital work. Please update your information with United Methodist Communications to ensure that you'll receive the latest information about services and resources, such as grants and training opportunities relevant to your leadership role at church. Update your information at umc.org forward slash update. Act now and receive a complimentary registration for the Digital Media for Ministry online course, a $19.99 value. Thank you. And now back to our program. Well, we've said before on this podcast that the best camera you have is the one you have with you. And it's better to just get started shooting video than to wait around until you have the quote unquote best or right equipment. For many of us, that is the camera on our smartphone. Podcasts like ours and, and manufacturers themselves, we've been pitching to all of you this idea that the, the camera on your cell phone is good enough to film a movie on, much less videos for the internet. Well, Catherine, as a professional video editor, producer what's your opinion are we telling people the truth are we stretching the truth or should we all be actively trying to find alternatives to our phones asap personally i think iphone and android cameras are great and i really rarely recommend upgrading to a real camera unless you are technologically inclined and are really trying to do a certain like a higher level of video content but i mean like steven soderbergh just released a his second video that was shot all on iphone mm. so or not video movie that was shot yeah. all on iphone so there are just so many built-in benefits to smartphone cameras like time lapse slow motion you can choose multiple formats and frame rates image stabilization really easy transfer to your computer like there are just so many good things about it that it's really really hard to uh justify 
uh, investing in a higher end camera if you're really not going to get the most out of it. The whole line, the best camera is the one that you have. I think what it really means is the best camera is the one that you know how to use because Mm. you could have a really great camera, but (laughs) if you don't know how to use it, then it doesn't really matter because it's just going to sit there. So uh, even people, if they're focused on primarily on social media videos, smartphone is definitely the greatest uh, tool for that. But I still think if smartphone is what you know and what you can easily access and use, then I think I still think smartphone is a great thing to focus on. And um, and I would lean into it. Like if that is what you're going to use, then lean into learning it, learning how to use it the best way possible, perfecting the lighting, audio, using the right type of apps that will make it even better. Like just focus on enhancing your production on the phone if that's what you're going to use. But and then if you have the time and do want to learn a new device, a DSLR, video camera, whatever it is, then that's fine too. Because I mean, smartphones do have their limitations, but uh, you really need to do your research ahead of time. And I would suggest uh, looking into the places that will let you rent rent the cameras and rent mm-hmm. gear ahead of time so that you can test it out and make sure that it is actually what you want to purchase. Because it's usually a big investment to get a brand new camera and then also invest your time in figuring it out. So yeah. um, I think there's a pl- there's a lot of websites like Lens to Go and then different like local businesses that will let you actually rent the gear. And I think that's a great way to decide whether or not you need to upgrade. That's a that's a really great recommendation. And actually, we're we're trying to figure out, as I mentioned in the last episode, cameras to add to our live streaming rig, and perhaps we can. Uh, you know, rent a camera to set yeah. them up in the sanctuary and actually look at, at what they what they look like. Now, you mentioned uh, apps, and that's a good reminder that the native camera app on your iPhone or Android is not your only choice. And while they, the you know, Apple and and Android have continued to add features and customization, uh, or, or or at least you know settings that you can tweak in the native camera app. There are other apps out there that are specifically built to help you shoot better video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ones that um, the one that I think is the easiest for like people who want a better video camera but don't know all of like the little things um, is Pro Movie. It I think it's like ten dollars maybe. Um, So it's like a mid-range app, but it really has a lot that you can do with it. And I think there is a free version of it also. And then it has like a lot of of the formatting and stuff that you would want if you have, or just if you want to mix it up. Well, if we were uh, to want to upgrade, what are your thoughts on filming with a video only camera, like a camcorder versus getting a DSLR that can do both photos and video? Um, We talked in the last episode about how not all DSLRs are built for live streaming, but for like shooting vlogs or testimony videos or or parts of worship uh, or announcement videos, things like that. What are your thoughts uh, on those two styles of camera? Yeah, I think if you if your video is more of a passive endeavor, <laughs> um, then a DSLR is probably going to be really useful um, because you're not trying to lug it around and you're mainly doing straight to camera talking head videos. Um, yeah, that's gonna DSLR is gonna have everything you need and can accommodate it. But then if you're trying to do more things like getting B roll and quickly grabbing the camera and shooting stuff in the field or inter- or interview style videos and all these different types of videos, then a video camera is what you really should look into. Mm-hmm. I know it seems like weird. I don't know why there's a stigma of just like video cameras being old school, but they're not. <laughs> they are still very relevant and still very capable. And uh, they're built to be a video camera. They're built, built to shoot video for a long period of time and to be moved around. So like simple things, just like the ergonomics of holding a video camera is so different than a DSLR. Like a DSLR is set to be, or is built to be set. You make a picture and then you reset it. And you're, you might be holding the Um, the lens, if it's like a huge lens and it's probably heavy. So you're using two hands. Like it's just like such a different experience physically than a video camera. A video camera is so much lighter and it's going to record for a lot longer. And the buttons are exactly where you need them to be, where your fingers are. Like it's just a different thing. And I personally think if your primary focus is shooting video, then get a video camera. The price tag is going to be like on the front end or like just uh, on the surface level, I think DSLRs will look like they're a little cheaper and in some cases they might be, but don't forget about like the accessories that you will have to have. So with a video camera, you don't really usually have a lot of lens attachments or anything. Everything's sort of built in. With a DSLR, you might have to have a 
couple different lenses in order to do a different things. And then you also have to have, for either case, you have to have SD cards, a tripod, like there's other costs that are going to be in it. And so I would decide first what type of device is going to serve you best before determining your budget. And, Mm -hmm. but once you do figure out which type you're going to get, be willing to spend the money to get the device that you're actually going to use. Uh, Because otherwise, don't worry about spending any money because you don't want to just sit in a closet or just do one thing and you're like, great, I need another camera because this one doesn't actually do everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Buying the wrong camera is going to be always be more expensive uh, than buying the right camera, Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's just that you can't end up doing the things you really wanted to do. Uh, But let's say we aren't ready or able yet to invest in a more professional setup. Let's say we're going to we're going to start, you know, we're going to be wise with our church finances. We're going to save toward it. So we're going to set aside a little bit a month or or whatever. Um, What are some things to remember about shooting on a phone that will help improve the quality of our video. We've talked a bit about, uh, you know, apps we can purchase to add to our phone, but mm-hmm. what are some of the things, even if we just use the native camera app, what are, what are some things we should definitely keep in, in mind as we're shooting on a phone? Yeah. So definitely look into your camera settings um, because the, you want to record the highest quality possible for whatever you're shooting. And that's not always what the default setting is, especially an iPhone. The, I'm pretty sure that the default now is all the camera formats are set to high efficiency. Do not shoot in high efficiency. Make sure you go into your camera format and set it to most compatible because high efficiency is a nightmare. And I don't care what Apple says. They say that, I mean, the reason it exists is because they wanted to create a file format that takes up less space so that people can record more and take more photos and have them stored on their phone. But, and they claim that it does not uh, sacrifice quality, but it does. So I don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) So change it to most compatible because that way you won't have to like reconfigure what your format is before you even get into editing. Um, So things like that. And then also just turning on the grid like so that it helps you with the composition and uh, with the framing of your shot. And then for sure, you need to use a tripod. Your A tripod is going to up your production value so much. And even if somebody is working the camera for you, they still need to be using a tripod. They don't need to be going handheld unless it's just like a spontaneous thing. Yeah, a tripod will really help with a lot of that stuff. And then also avoid using the front facing or the selfie camera except if you're doing like an informal live video that's the selfie camera is gonna be great but the lens on that one is not as powerful as the rear facing lens so um, be sure to wipe off the back lens (laughs) before you start recording (laughs) Uh, because there's always gonna be muck over muck on it or whatever and um and so just make sure that's like clean and then use that one and then if you're using the audio from your phone uh just make sure your phone case isn't muffling it some of the phone cases uh will sort of cover up part of the speakers and it sort of messes with the sound of the video well, I'll say I, I learned something. I literally, as you're talking, am in the settings of my phone, changing the format. <laughs> uh, so so I, literally, as you're sharing, I'm like in the settings of my phone, changing it from high efficiency because I didn't even realize like that that was an option, which I'm uh. kind of, again, embarrassed to say. But, you know, because I've tried to transfer pictures to people and sometimes they can't open them. And but yeah, that is why. Like if, if you try to use the Amazon, like I know some people have their photos saved or like automatically saved to their Amazon Prime yeah, like photos. Yeah. And that is one of the areas where it doesn't convert because my friend tried to create a photo album using those. And she was like, all of the photos say they don't, they're not compatible. And I was like, I know exactly why. It's because of that high efficiency setting that I hate. I get the value of saving space. And most um, most programs, and like if you download your photos onto your laptop, there is a... Um, a script that like it will it automatically converts the photos for you so you don't actually realize that it's converting it for you mm. but for some things like in between apps that might not exist yet and so it gets caught because uh the other app doesn't recognize that file format yeah well once we have the video on our phone or or even some of the apps we're going to talk about in a second can actually serve as a camera but we talked about specifically camera apps before but uh 
there's a lot of editing we can actually do right on our phone. You know, in a second, we'll talk about desktop editing. Uh, but particularly if you're on the fly or you want to do things quickly, there are some tools out there that allow you to edit decent, even high quality video right on your phone. Yeah. One of the apps that just sort of appeared on every iPhone, uh, I think a, cu- a, f- a couple of updates ago, it's called Clips and it's a it's an all-in-one video app. So it is, you can shoot video in it, you can import uh, photos or videos from your camera roll. And then inside of it, you can edit it together. You can create graphics or text or even add captions, which is just like such a cool feature to me. The whole like captions on the fly thing in that app is really, really powerful. And then they also have music that you can add to it. And you can do it all like in this one little app. And it's specifically for social media videos. So I wouldn't use this for like professional video content. But like, I mean, even still, you can use it for to make really good little clips. (laughs) It's very aptly named. Um, So that's a really great one to try out and just like test out. I did a tutorial for MyCom on that one. So um, you can look at that and um, see what all it can do. Um, And then Adobe Rush is uh, Adobe's newest uh, mobile friendly editing software or editing program. It's sort of like an, it's sort of in between iMovie and Premiere, um, but it's specifically tailored to be mobile friendly. So if you have Adobe, that's a great one to try out. And there's lots of tutorials online to figure out that one. And then one other app that I personally like and I just sort of accidentally discovered is called Double Take. And it it's free somehow. I still don't understand how it's free, <laughs> yeah. but it lets you record multiple lenses on your phone all at the same time. So it basically turns your one camera iPhone into a multi-camera shoot. So you can have your telephoto lens, your regular lens and your selfie lens all recording at the same time and then have three different clips to use to edit with, which I just think is so cool. Yeah. So you, you could like, you could set it up on a tripod between two people. Right. And with one phone, just record with, and, and with, you know, the host would probably just be the, the selfie side, but then the guest, you could have a wide and a close up. Yeah. And like one of the things that a lot of that you'll see when you're looking at like tips for iPhone videos is never use the zoom. But the reason they say that is because if you're doing the pinch and drag or whatever, the pinch zoom that when you're in between the two lenses, it isn't as good as if you just press that one times or two times button that um, zooms in because that switches between the lenses. So those two lenses are great if you wanted to like zoom in, but when you're actually doing a digital zoom, it, doesn't look right. So when you already have those two shots together, it, you're actually getting the best of both worlds because now you have a two angle shot of one thing. So yeah, it's just really cool. I just can't believe it must be like a beta version because I just can't believe that it's free. Yeah. Wow. Catherine, you are, I'm literally grabbing my phone again to install this app <laughs> as we're talking. Um, uh, folks, you are you are getting more than what you were paying for when you listen to today's uh, <laughs> podcast. Well, uh, let's get in. Let's get into lighting. Like audio, um, it's often overlooked, particularly in church videos, because mm-hmm. again, I mean, lighting it might it might cost money, uh, but there are some tricks you can do uh, to help out with lighting. What are your thoughts on on lighting, Catherine? Yeah, generally, I think the best lighting is whatever is most convenient for you because, yes, lighting kits uh, can seem like they're going to be great, but there's also just like a lot of little things where like one lighting kit might not – like there's not a one-size-fits-all. So you might get one set of lights and it works in one area, but it doesn't really work in another area and it doesn't work on a wide angle. So it's just really hard to find – one simple solution that's going to always work for you. So usually whatever's most convenient is fine, but it really comes down to like the positioning of your lights. Like just imagine like a lighting from below with a flashlight. That's like a ghost story. But then lighting from above is with the same flashlight is like an interrogation. So like it's all about the position of what the lighting is. The general standard lighting situation is like the three point lighting, which is the key light, which is just the main light in the front on one side of the camera fill light, which is on the other side, a little bit lower, and then a backlight. And all of them are like facing the subject. So that's usually like a general rule just to understand like how to get the positioning right and how to get the uh, the coloring right and like the shadows. Mm-hmm. Um, flat lighting is another good one of just like two, two lights on either side of the camera, a little bit above the, le- like higher than the lens. 
and facing the subject. Your main thing is you just want to get rid of those shadows on the subject and even out the lighting as, as much as you can. Because also one of the biggest things is just make sure that your subject is facing the light source. <laughs> the worst is like having a camera that's facing the light and the person sitting in front of it and or like in front of a window and like all you see is their silhouette and it's like oh my gosh if they could just like move to the side this would be so much better so like even if overhead lighting is all you have don't have the person sitting directly under it just move them over a bit move them back or something and it's going to get rid of those shadows that are like a raccoon shadow on their face so yeah, yeah. so just simple stuff like that well, and uh, and obviously we've all viewed and maybe even shot backlit videos where someone's got a window behind them and they're suddenly mm -hmm. just a silhouette but are there i mean i know that there are because i've you know kind of used it as a hack is it possible when you have bigger windows to actually use some natural light if it's a you know you don't have a bunch of you know clouds yeah. come in and out can you actually maybe use a window set yourself up near a window in such a way that it actually becomes a part of the lighting yeah you definitely can i think natural light is like i mean it's free i know i get it but it can be an angel or a devil because sure. it is i mean it's great for photos that's like the best situation for natural light but if and if it's a full cloud coverage day then you're probably going to be okay if your shoot is like under an hour but for anything longer, like mm. I would never use natural light as like your main light. I would gotcha. just like use it as in addition and be like, oh, this is great. I have this wonderful natural light. Let me just pop a couple clamp lights on the side and that's going to even it out and make sure that I don't see any like shading if the sun happens to or if a cloud happens to move. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just when you're shooting video, like you're just going to as time passes, like you're going to you're not going to notice it in the moment but when you get into the editing and you try to cut between two different between an end shot and a beginning shot you're gonna be like oh my gosh the lighting is completely different because yeah. the time changed <laughs> when so. even i've had videos where you know the camera is changing the aperture and exposure and yeah. things as the light is moving around and and sometimes you even like literally your skin color will change in the middle uh -huh, of a yeah. video. Yeah, that's one of the things that you can do on the iPhone. Like you can lock it um, before you start shooting, like just by like tapping on the screen and then dragging your finger up and down and that little sun right. thing appears. And so doing that is really important if you don't want it to start adjusting on the fly, like as you're recording. Mm. Well, let's uh, let's talk about editing, and uh, and now we're going to talk about bringing it to the desktop. Let's uh, say we're we're this is a project that we're going to invest some time in, and uh, we want to know what what some of the options are. You know, there's obviously programs like iMovie, which are limited but relatively user friendly and included on I'm pretty sure all Macs. Uh, then you have some more professional caliber apps that have definitely more of a learning curve like Adobe Premiere, which is a paid app. Uh, and you even have some options like DaVinci Resolve, which is more powerful, but it's also free or at least has a free version. If there are folks out there who are willing uh, to invest some time into learning video editing, uh, what programs do you like and or what do you recommend to someone getting started? Yeah, so the um, the I guess the common trifecta are the ones that you mentioned. It's Adobe Premiere and After Effects and then DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut. Um, those are the top three, I would say, main ones. iMovie is one that is, uh, it's, people use it because it's free, but I would not say that, I would say the skills that you have to use for iMovie are not really transferable to the other programs. So mm, if you yeah. know iMovie and then you try to move to something else, it's going to be a really <laughs> difficult transition. Yeah. Yep. So I, if you're just starting out, I would say do not touch iMovie. Go to DaVinci because it is free and it is amazing and has so many things because they specifically wanted to offer a professional grade editing software that was free plus they have the paid version which is more which is for like a really higher end production studios that's their main target so um so they just really are very generous with this yeah. free version that they just keep updating and when well, they're they're yeah. a camera manufacturer so they are they it comes from black magic who makes cameras and so it's kind of like 
that, you know, having the iTunes store, like to sell iPods or selling iPods right. to, to fund the store. So like, yeah, but no, it's, it's, I, I have learned some DaVinci Resolve. It, it is a learning curve, but it is amazing what you can do in this free program. Yeah. And that's the, yeah. Like the other thing I use Premiere and After Effects, but I just really like a, the way that Adobe like works with each other, but you can also use DaVinci when you like as the color grader. Cause that was I think what it was originally, how it originally worked with Premiere. But so it really works that way. But you can't really work from DaVinci into other things as easily. Um, So it's like you can be all into DaVinci or all into something else plus DaVinci. So I don't know. There's just all these different combos. Right. But then a lot of people really like Final Cut too. I used that in college and I don't know why, but I just could not get it. Mm -hmm. I could not find a groove with it and... So personally, I prefer Premiere, but I think it's just because I'm, for some reason, I'm faster with Premiere than I am with Final Cut. So I would say the biggest thing is just if you decide to go off the radar and use a different program, just make sure that you can find a lot of free tutorials and resources on how to use it, because that is like the best way to learn anything. I mean, at least for me, I find those really helpful. Um, I know there are different type of learning styles, but if you don't have any way of getting like a knowledge base or seeing tutorials that are already free, you're going to have a really tough time learning it unless you're just like really good at it. So um, that would be one of the things that I would just make sure to look for if you're not going to use one of the popular ones. But, and then also don't worry about like trying to change your whole setup just to cater to the editing program. There are all the ones that are out there. There is something for whatever you're already doing. So don't, so find one that's compatible with what you are already, what you already know. Don't try to just like start over because you need an editing program. Yeah. Well, and, and I learned almost all that I learned from YouTube tutorials. Now they're not, Mm -hmm. they don't always teach you the best or most efficient way to do what you're trying to do. But if you look for the videos that have a lot of views, a lot of thumbs up, you know, and in the comments you see people who, you know, affirm that it's teaching some solid things. You can learn a lot from YouTube, even if it isn't always maybe the best way to do things. If you're caught in a pinch, you can learn a lot there. Yeah, I really like the YouTube tutorial stuff. And then also like reading in the comments or on like forums. There's mm. a lo- always a lot of like usually the comments of the forums really help me figure out what it is, what the word is that I'm trying to figure out how to yeah. do that. Right. So then I know what to even like search for in YouTube. Like sometimes I'm like, I just don't even know what this would be called. So um, so yeah, I just I really like the being able to use a lot of the different online resources that are already available and that they are just out there because people do help each other figure stuff out because there's just so much that each one is capable of. And so it's really hard to know every single thing unless somebody's already done it. Exactly. And uh, so, Catherine, we're we're drawing to a close of our time together. And so I know that I am asking you to answer a question that has a million different aspects to it very succinctly. Uh, but we need to talk about something that is touchy for some people in the church communications field, and that is copyright. We, I'm thinking mostly about the music we use in our videos and podcasts, but even using photos and video clips in our projects, either as B-roll or the main imagery on our screens. You know, I am hearing this argument less, although it still persists, and that's, you know, we're not a commercial enterprise, and we're doing this for a good cause, and this is for the gospel and for the kingdom, so shouldn't we be able to use this stuff for free. You know, you can be as detailed as you want. We probably need a whole other episode on this, but yeah. but as a professional working in the field, can you talk to us about why it is so important that we respect the copyrights both for our own work and the the resources that are available out there? Yeah, so I think that's the biggest thing is to think of it from both sides. If somebody wants to use your work, wouldn't you want them to just ask you if it's okay? (laughs) And wouldn't you want them to include your name with it, to give you credit for it so that if people felt connected to it, they know who to go to? And then on the other side, if you are using someone else's work, don't you want to give them credit for it? I don't know. It's just a hard, it's hard for me to understand why you wouldn't want to do that if that's allowed. And it's definitely a, I don't know. I just think we need to shift our mindset about copyrights in general and look at it more as a benefit rather than a limitation because that's really why it was created in the first place um, to promote creativity and collaboration and encourage more creators to work 
and to make new things and to build off of each other. And that's how new culture and new ideas even happen because uh, content creation relies on building off of each other and sharing and circulating with the creator's rights in mind and public interest. So it's not there to limit you and to say, no, no, you can't use this unless you pay for it. That's not always the case. There's fair right. use. There's plenty of like ways around it. But I think just in general, giving credit is always great. It's not a, it's it does not forgive a copyright infringement. You can't just credit somebody's work and be like, all right, well, that's fine. I credited them, so they can't get mad at me. Yes, they can. <laughs> and they can, and it can cost you a lot of money. But so being a, aware of what is and what isn't fair use is really important. If you look on the Center for Media and Social Impact website, they are a nonprofit organization who is literally their purpose is to share the nuances of copyright and fair use in online content and video content specifically. Like they are trying to educate creators and media makers on those things so that they know how to employ them correctly. And so they have some great PDF guides on their website that I think people should look at. It will really help you understand what you can and can't do. And then Creative Commons is the like universal licensing organization that has made copyright licensing and using license work using licensed work online so much easier. And so they have a but several tiers of licensing that if you go on their website, they explain every single one. You can search on their website for different sources, depending on what your level of use is going to be. Public domain is obviously, you can use that always, but the Creative Commons, the one that's basically just one step above public domain is CCO or Creative Commons Zero. That's the most liberal license and you can use it, manipulate it, do whatever you want with that content and you don't have to credit the author. But then there are other licenses that it's literally, yeah, you can use this, you can change it. All you have to do is credit this person because they're the creator. So like, it's just like so simple. Like, oh, it's just an attribution. Like, uh, I don't know. I just think it's a really great thing to be able to use, work with other people and collaborate and create something based off of someone else's work that you might even create a new opportunity for a connection with somebody else. So yeah, so yeah, I think it's a good thing to use. Music definitely is the hardest thing because it involves two levels of copyright. It involves the copyright on the sheet music and then a copyright on the performance of it. So that's why it's so difficult with music and yeah, yeah. why it's a little better to err on the side of caution and uh, just go ahead and like buy a subscription or some like credits to a subscription or to a license, a royalty free website that has music because um, it's just really tricky. And like uh, websites like YouTube and Facebook, they don't have control over taking down your over like whether or not you do have copyright and yours gets flagged. Like they are responsible. They're liable for uh, taking down your work if the copyright owner says so. They, they, that's the person they answer to. They don't answer to anything else and they want the creator and the user to figure it out amongst themselves. So you could do everything right and you might still have your content pulled down and you just have to re-upload it. That's just how it is. So being as careful as you can is really important and it will, and it's also just like um, good practice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, you know, we, we could have touched on this during our live stream episode, like your worship service can get muted. Like they can literally mm -hmm. turn the audio off if their computer's, hear copyrighted music and so you know don't you like don't stream spotify in the five minute countdown yeah. to, you know to your worship service like don't do your you know high school graduation video with you know some country song in the background because right. it's gonna it's gonna get muted uh or you know it's just you got to be careful with this stuff yeah um, a lot of videographers get uh like huge lawsuits for like wedding videos yeah yeah and and i you know i hate to say it folks but if you've listened this far you can't plead ignorance anymore i mean it's it's and really you shouldn't have been able to before this we all know yeah. that and and i'll just mention you have a couple uh sites here in in your notes where where free stock photos come from and as church communicators man we're always looking for that awesome shot yeah. of the mountain we can put a Bible verse over top of all of the cover images for this podcast come from unsplash.com super high quality photos no not even attribution needed like right. we I think we try to put them in the show notes just because we want to love our neighbor and you know mm -hmm. not steal stuff but that's not even that's not even necessary now 
Unsplash is very popular. So if you find a super popular image, a lot of other people may have used the same image. Right, but yeah. uh, man, what are, uh, so Unsplash is there. You also have uh, Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S. Yeah, Pexels.com. That one's a really great one. They also have videos on there. I don't know if Unsplash yeah. has videos, but I'm always just like blown away by the quality of them because they just seem like such great quality photos and videos. And I'm like, man, you guys are so generous for giving this for free. So I always appreciate those. I put together a a Bible verse, uh, like sort of video montage using all um, stock video footage available for free. There's good stuff out there. You have to, you know, you have to do a little work to to patch it together, but uh, it is possible. It is possible. Yeah. And then there's also free or uh, subscription sites or paid sites where you can mm-hmm. buy a stock photo like Adobe stock or uh, pond five. But, and so you might get, you just have a lot more options that way. And you might be able to get a little more specific about what you're looking for. So that is still a benefit. And we use that sometimes for, um, for videos, especially if we need to, if we just can't find a free, right. something free for us. Um, but then also like pond five, they do, if you're on their email list, they'll send you, they send a free clip out every week. Um, which I just like that. <laughs> I think that's, that's cool. such a great perk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I use uh, soundstripe.com for music for videos. That's mm-hmm. a, it's a it's paid, but it's not. It's really not that much for the library. And they just teased this last week that they too are going to start adding uh, stock uh, video footage in there. So oh. there's there's new stuff all the time. Yeah, the one that we use is uh, Universal Production Music. That's mm-hmm. the, the one that we use at work. And but then there is like freepd.com. That's like the public domain music site. If you go on Creative Commons, they have a whole list of other ones. Uh, Muse Open is one that's specifically for like classical music performed by orchestras. But again, that one, like they even say on their website, if you have any <laughs> concerns, be sure to follow up with like we they just trust that whoever's uploading the sa- the music is either somebody who recorded it or was performing in it and so they had access to that file but they can't really for sure say that that is a that it's public domain or that it's like free to use because right. so like you still have to be a little cautious if you are just getting stuff for free um especially with music because I don't know. It's just that double layer of copyright is just difficult. So whenever you see like royalty free music, that does not mean free music. That means that when you pay for it once, it's royalty free. Like you're not having to repay it every time you buy it. If you want free music, you have to find free royalty free. Right. Which is like, okay, to, okay, okay, okay. Right. You have to know you have to know what you're looking for. As you could tell, we need a whole episode on this. In yeah, the I know. Like the, the when you search something on Google and hit the images tab, those are not free. Those are not free <laughs> for you to use. You can look at them, but you can't take them. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. It's clear you still have so much to teach us, and I'm sure we'll have you back in the future. But thanks for being with us both last month and this month. Thank you. And now, listeners, we want to hear from you. What is your level of confidence with video and audio? What tips or tricks would you share? And what questions can we address on future episodes? Email us at podcast at umcom.org and we just might share your answers on a future episode. And don't forget, you can use that email, podcast at umcom.org to share what you've learned from this crazy year. We can't wait to hear from you. Finally, if you found this podcast to be helpful and you'd like to make sure other church communicators like yourself find this resource, the two biggest things you can do are share this episode with your friends and colleagues and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or whatever service you're listening to us on right now. Thanks again for listening to the MyCon Church Marketing Podcast. <laughs>